All right, so yes, thank you for being here. Welcome. This is our third class in our Sustainable Yard Care series. And this class is all about creating habitat for wildlife. It's gonna be super exciting. It's a great topic. Um, my name is Kristen Covey, and I'm going to be the facilitator today and um, hopefully tech support. Um, <laughs> and I am an educator with the, the King County Wastewater Treatment Division. And I normally teach about wastewater and stormwater. Um, we have two presenters today, and um, one is Monica Vanderveeren, and she was here last class if you were at our native plants class. She is also an employee with the King County Wastewater Treatment Division, um, and we're really excited to have her back today, and she's going to be here again next weekend. Um, and we also have Sarah Rosero, who's from the Snohomish Conservation District, and she is the Community Engagement mm -hmm. Coordinator. And this is her second year as a presenter in this series, and we're super excited to have her back. She's also going to be presenting at the next class as well. Um, this class is being recorded, and that means that if you would rather not madly take notes and just relax and listen, um, if this recording will be available um, for you to view later on. It'll probably take about a week to post online, and once it does, I will send an email out to everyone just to let you know it's ready, and I will include the link to that. I will also be sending you a PDF version of all the slides that you'll see today. Um, that will be emailed to you probably in the next couple days. And it will also include a lot of links to really helpful resources that you'll see in this presentation and also some additional ones. I assume there are some people that are new to this series in the audience. Um, we have a lot of folks joining us today, which is awesome. So for those of you that are new, I just wanted to give you a little background on these classes. So this series is a partnership brought to you by the King County Wastewater Treatment Division and the Snohomish Conservation District. And this is our seventh year doing the series. And we're really kind of glad to, in some ways, have it be online the last two years because we've been able to really spread our reach and um, have a lot of new people join and get to teach people about all these important topics. Um, so in the past, we typically gathered at um, an education center called Brightwater Center, which is at one of our wastewater treatment plants um, in Western King County. Actually, sorry, it's just across the county line in Snohomish County. So on the slide, there's a map on the left-hand side that's showing you the location of the treatment plant and the center. Um, and that is exactly why King County partners with the Snohomish Conservation District for these classes. Um, we not only share a passion for improving water quality, but we also share community members. Mm -hmm. So in the center of the slide is the the photo of where we would gather at the education center um, at Brightwater. And um, on the right hand side of the slide is a box showing you the upcoming classes that still are going to happen in the series. So we've done three and we have three more. So we have Living with Wildlife next weekend, Sustainable Food Gardening um, the next Saturday after that, and then Be a Good Water Steward on February 12th. So these classes are every Saturday starting at 10 a.m. So just a quick um, overview of our agency, the King County Wastewater Treatment Division. The map on the bottom right is showing you our service area where we treat and clean wastewater. And it's really large. We clean water for about 1.8 million people living in Western King County and Southwest Snohomish County. So obviously cleaning wastewater is a huge part of what we do and it's our main focus, but we also provide a lot of educational opportunities and support to the communities we serve, um, especially out of our Brightwater Center location. And one way we do that is by offering these free classes to promote a healthy environment, but we also have um, family programs, which one is happening right now outside, um, and uh, school programs for um, third through 12th graders. And those normally happen quite often um, when we're not in a pandemic. And just to go over some of the logistics of this class. So um, we're gonna keep everyone on mute and um, we'll be using the uh, chat box for communication during the presentation. So feel free to put questions into the chat box while Monica and Sarah are presenting. And they're going to just kind of go back and forth um, talking about different sections throughout the talk. Um, 
So the person that's not talking will do their best to respond to the questions in the chat box. So Monica and Sarah are going to be very busy, um, but we hope to leave about 15 minutes at the end uh, for questions, more questions, and any that we weren't able to address in the chat box during the presentation. At the end, during the Q&A, if um, the chat box is not easy for you to use, feel free to use the raise hand feature, which is um, under the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen. And that way um, we can call on you and then you can ask your question verbally. All right. And finally, as much as we would love to see your faces, even though we really can't. Um, we're going to ask you to turn your videos off um, because of the bandwidth issue, because there are a lot of folks in the audience today. Um, we just want to make sure the speakers audio and videos are working well. So if you don't mind keeping your videos off, that will help with the bandwidth. All right, so I am going to turn it over to Monica to start the presentation. I'm Monica, um, and I saw somebody was interested in owls. Here's a long-eared owl that came from my yard. So um, we're starting out on the right foot for some of our, uh, or the right talon for some of our participants. Um, I'm really pleased to be here with Sarah for the second year talking about wildlife, and we'll be together again next week talking about managing all this wonderful wildlife you're going to get to your yard. This is a fairly complex topic and we are really fortunate to have a very broad audience of people all over. So what we're gonna do is really look at um, trying to give you an overview of things that are applicable for a wide range of areas. So we're the Pacific Northwest, as Kristen said, but what we're gonna look at is, you know, what can we do that's a general concept that will support land, uh, wildlife any place. Next. So we really have a lot of information to share, but it's really in three broad areas. So why should we all be building habitat at home? I'll introduce that. Sarah's gonna do a deep dive into what is habitat. And you'll start to see ways as both of us talk that you can create habitat. And then we'll really get into some nuts and bolts of the elements of habitat at the end. Um, and as people have been asking about um, the presentations, past presentations, Kristen's been sending out PDFs of all the presentations. You can get that, and then we'll have all the recordings online. So if you miss something, again, relax and listen and ask questions and chat in the chat. That's a really great opportunity for people to interact. Um, and so, you know, feel free to just not be taking copious notes if you don't feel like it and just catch up later. And with that, I'm going to have uh, Sarah introduce herself. Perfect. Thank you, Monica, and thank you, Kristen. I'm really excited to be joining everyone for a second year of doing a landscaping for wildlife. Um, so I'm Sarah Rosero. I've been at the Conservation District for about four years now. Um, before that, I was in the military, um, but my whole life I have loved wildlife. And when I was younger, I wrote a letter to President Bill Clinton at the time saying like, they are cutting down the trees. I see deer, they're losing their homes. What can we do? Got a nice letter back. And that really has spurred my passion and interest in creating habitat for wildlife. And I really try to do that in my home space in Marysville, Washington, where I live. Um, but have been a part of wildlife surveys uh, for Western toads and various bird species. So just really excited to be sharing my passion with you all today. Um, and some of the things I've done is really being able to look at amphibians has been some of like the most wildlife surveys I've done. Um, but I'm really interested in really contributing to wildlife science and citizen science. So I do that by documenting through iNaturalist and eBirds some of the wildlife I'm seeing uh, when I go out and recreate. And then Monica will share a little bit about herself and where she lives. As uh, Kristen said, thank you, this is Monica. As Kristen said, um, I do work for the King County Wastewater Treatment Division, but I am a huge uh, wildlife buff. We do a lot of natural area restoration, so um, I really support what my agency does. Um, I actually grew up in the city of Chicago. My apartment building from Google Earth is in the building in upper left. We had a park across the street. We, my mother actually grew a garden in our apartment. Uh, and we had a park where I would take people's dumped rabbits and bring them home. And I raised hamsters in the closet. So um, I've had this problem since I was a child. 
Then we moved to Minnesota. We had timber wolves and moose. I will tell you that I have a lifelong fear of moose from that experience. I would rather be around grizzly bears. Um, I finally bought my first and the only house I've had. It's on the ancestral lands of the Tulalip peoples along the Snohomish River. Um, and I've lived there for about 22 years. I've done a lot of landscaping for wildlife and um, have done a lot. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, I will tell you I'm a wildlife generalist. So um, I will show a lot of bird pictures. Most of the pictures in the presentation are mine and I'll show a lot of bird pictures. I'm actually not a birder. Um, I like anything that crawls, walks, swims, flies. Um, and so you're gonna see bird pictures, but I really like pretty much anything and I'm landscaping for it. So as I was saying, I do a lot of presentations. Um, I have volunteered, that's the way I give back um, as a volunteer, both in charitable donations and presentations. And I've done booths as a volunteer. And I've done this for Fish and Wildlife and the Conservation District and National Wildlife Federation. It's just a cool thing to do. And I learn a lot from our audiences. That's why I encourage you to share in the chat because we can't get together in a room with uh, coffee and tea and pastries and talks. So share in the chat. I have started to do online multimedia, which is more appealing to um, younger generations. It's more interactive. And so there's a link to, I we had a pandemic bird challenge and I did my year in wildlife at home on the first year of work from home. So now you know who we are. So let's transition into why you should build habitat. And what I'm hoping is that you will see the value of creating even the tiniest bit of habitat in whatever your landscape is. Um, so I see a request, can people turn off their video um, because it's distracting for others? So just a note to everybody. Um, so just to start out and kind of inspire you, ha really habitat can, will come and life will come in some of the harshest places. So this image is from Baffin Island. It's in the Arctic Circle. And it's an area where there's currently an ice cap and recently glaciers have scraped through this valley. So I trekked through here a few years ago. It's a polar desert, it's a really harsh environment. Um, and you can see the walls of these mountains are really scraped bare. But where life can take hold, it does. It is, there's teeny, teeny little willows no taller than your knees. Um, but there is a lot of life even in this harsh, harsh place. Next. This same cycle has happened actually in our area of Western Washington historically during the last ice age, which ended about 11,700 years ago. We had a giant ice sheet that carved out Puget Sound as an inland fjord. It was a mile deep. So a lot of our homes would have been under ice or getting flooded out at the edges. A lot of our hills come from glaciers. When the ice was finally gone, life moved in. We ended up with towering forests and thousands of species of plants and wildlife, um, really rich place and a lot of people living and thriving on the land when the first Europeans came here. So um, this happened again, we have repeated this cycle. You can click again, there's another image on here, Sarah. Um, we repeated this cycle when we first showed up as settlers, um, I'm European ancestry. And so what you see on the left is what's called the Denny Regrade Project. This would have been a glacial dump by that ice sheet. It would have left all this dirt. And they decided to extend the land down into the tide flats in Seattle. I had a project in Magnolia a couple of years ago. They've literally platted streets out into the tidelands that have names. They're underwater still because we stopped doing this. But this was the plan was to smooth down all these hills. And that removes a lot of habitat. What we do now is build houses and schools and shopping centers and streets, and that actually removes habitat. So you see the housing development look at the right, and they've taken all the plants off and we have bare dirt. Now, what they're likely to put back in that space is gonna be easy to care for, low maintenance, drought tolerant plants. But building actual habitat and bringing some of our native structure back can be really, really beneficial for a number of reasons. First of all, for birds and for insects. So I saw people like birds and insects. Smithsonian did a study that found that about 70% of your yard needs to be native plants to have a healthy insect population to help birds like the Spiewicks, Wren, right, feed their young. Okay, insects, kind of yucky to eat. I mean, they're actually a good food source, I should say that but we don't normally eat them for cultural reasons. 
but they are very fatty and pro proteinaceous. They're also, insects are one of the major pollinators of our plants. There are a lot of different pollinators, but insects are very important pollinators. The other thing that you help when you build healthy habitat is you actually protect wildlife that's a far long way from your house. So I live on a river. The watershed is hundreds of miles square. Everything that drains comes past my house or the main stem of the river. Okay, so if you have very little pesticide, very little fertilizer and rich, deep organic soil that's in, you have plants taking up rain so it's not scouring off your landscape and sending sediment downstream, you actually are protecting the water quality where our marine mammals like seals and sea lions and orcas are, you know, otters, um, we've got seabirds, you're protecting the water quality that makes Puget Sound and our creeks and rivers and lakes really a lush and wonderful place. So your habitat is actually helping wildlife that's a long way away from your door. Uh, nature can actually help you control a lot of pests. And so next week I'll talk about living with wildlife. Um, I know people have mixed feelings about coyotes. I live with coyotes. The coyote on the left is my friend. And I will talk about what it means to live with coyotes and how to do it in a safe way. Um, but they eat a tremendous amount of rodents. They are showing up more and more in our cities. And I'll talk about that. They are really big rodent hounds. They also will eat things like um, uh, cherries and apples and things like that. They're, they're food generalists, but the rodent and rabbits. Rabbits, I, we have so many rabbits. Uh, in the middle, you see a dragonfly. They're great for keeping mosquitoes down along with bats and barn swallows and other birds. On the right is a red-tailed hawk I saw just last week uh, in a really dense fog like we have today. And it had caught a meadow vole. And meadow voles can be really problematic for people's landscape plants and for crops. On the lower left is a garter snake. Um, and that garter snake is a big fan of slugs as a diet. So we have a lot of non-native slugs in the Pacific Northwest. They came in with plant materials and they eat a lot of our plants. We have native slugs that tend to eat detritus like leaves and stuff. The non-native ones eat our plants and the slugs eat them. So wildlife can actually help you with pest control. It's also very healing um, to have nature in your backyard and surrounding you. Um, plants actually create really good air quality. They provide habitat. And then you can see the cycle of nature right in front of your eyes. So when the pandemic started here, we got thrown out of our offices on March 5th at 2.30 in the afternoon and never returned two years ago. And it was very disorienting. We had no idea what we were going to be in for. And I uh, started to go out and take dog walks every day and because it was safe. My area is rural and you can keep distance from people. And I would take my camera with. And just watching wildlife go through the natural cycle of their lives, migratory species come in and out. It was really, for me, healing. There have been studies about children with ADHD doing better with exposure to nature. Um, people with depression, you know, you still may need supportive therapies for depression, but it, that exposure to nature can help people with depression and other issues. So for all of us, it can be very healing. And I have said for 15 years, and I have not lied, I can say this is the truth. If you build habitat, they will come even small amounts of habitat. I literally worked with an apartment complex to put hummingbird gardens on their, gal on their balconies, and it was phenomenally successful. And they were in the middle of a city. So um, you can build even the smallest amount of habitat and you will get species. So this image, this is North America. Uh, everybody is on a flyway where you've got birds flying back and forth. I just heard yesterday on the radio, there is a fin whale. This is the second largest whale in, on the planet. There's a fin whale in Puget Sound, right? We've got a lot of wildlife passing our doors. I didn't realize how much I had until I was staying at home and taking pictures. So in the lower left is a picture of a lazuli bunting. Um, and what's listed online is that there's a stable population south, way south of me in Puyallup. It turns out they've been back every summer. They were probably here, but we have no birders and nobody recorded them. So there's wildlife around all of us wherever we live and we just don't know that yet. So if you build even little bits of habitat, stuff will show up.
And with that, I have been talking and talking about Habitat, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who's now going to do that deep dive into what is Habitat anyway. Thank you, Monica. Okay, so what is Habitat? Are we just providing food for wildlife? But it really is more than that. You know, we want to look at the life cycle of whatever species you're trying to attract, your favorite, something that you really want to see in your home space. Um, but, you know, we need to consider all the things that they need. And, you know, it's kind of akin, going back to Fantastic Mr. Fox that we have pictured here. Um, it's kind of like if you're just providing plants for food like nectar and pollen and then some like you know feeding birds with bird seed and things like that it's kind of as is, as if you would raise a human family in a grocery store and you can imagine there's plenty of food to eat in that grocery store but where are they going to sleep where are they going to bathe and everything like that so having larger considerations for really keeping stable and providing habitat all year round for the wildlife that you want to attract in your home space. So some of the main elements of creating habitat is going to be these four elements we'll be diving in deeper throughout the presentation. So we're looking at food, water, shelter or cover, and then nesting places. So places to raise young. It's really fulfilling that huge life cycle of each species and being able to discern um, and evaluate what you have on your own in your own home space. So if we're going to use uh, butterflies as an example of creating habitat, you know, we have lots of local butterflies and Monica has been able to document this with all the photos of uh, butterflies she sees on her property. And um, it's really paying attention to and doing a little research if you're like specifically looking at one species of what they need for their life cycle. So when it comes to butterflies, we're thinking about host plants. You know, they're going to be laying eggs on these plants. And then when those eggs hatch, they're going to be consuming parts of those plants to, you know, being able to fulfill their life cycle to go on to the next stage. And in terms of, you know, great plants, we have strawberry pictured here and some ocean spray. And many people think that the plant called butterfly bush is also a great plant. And it can be. So it, it does provide some nectar for butterflies. But when butterflies do lay their eggs on a butterfly bush, the eggs hatch and the, those larvae are not able to eat the butterfly bush. So they're essentially just not able to eat and they die, unfortunately. So looking at native plants and what can you provide. Um, thistle is always a great one, but having an idea of like the type of host plants you want to provide to butterflies. And so many folks, um, and I think this is more of like cleanliness, people like to aesthetically see like a nice clean um, yard to some degree, and that's fair, but we are asking folks to leave the leaves uh, for many reasons. Um, so butterflies will lay chrysalids on leaves and the, the leaves fall onto the ground, and then we rake them up and we, you know, dispose of them and we put them in the yard waste bin and they're off to somewhere else um, and no longer in your yard. So being able to leave the dead foliage, um, you can move them to another space on your yard and you can layer them around your plants if you don't want them necessarily in the grass, but being able to keep um, leaves and other dead foliage on the property because you never know what is in there and what's going to use it or what you'd be getting rid of. Then we have food and water for butterflies. Oops, sorry, I was just making sure I got those pictures on there. Um, so butterflies need lots of things besides, you know, nectar and things like that. So they need small puddles to get water. They need minerals and amino acids. So Monica has some great photographs here where there's little butterflies, you know, on a piece of poop trying to get some of those resources out of the feces and then um, being able to get some of those minerals and things out of the water and the soil, so those little puddles. I don't know if any of you have had the experience of going for a walk and it's you know somewhat forested or just more so out in nature. 
and you're walking along and there's little puddles and you see, you know, little butterflies or moths fly up. And I, after learning that, you know, seeing they need puddles for water and everything else, like shallow areas where they're not going to fall in and drown into the water, you see it a lot more. So pay attention next time you're out on the walk and there's little puddles around maybe after a fresh rain and butterflies are out and you might see them a lot more which I think is just another great advantage to keeping your eyes open and knowing what to look for. Uh, so going back to the food and shelter for all life stages, right? So we are using the painted lady here as one of our examples. So we go from eggs to larvae and then that chrysalis and adult. So, you know, what is going to support these eggs? Which plants do you want to plant? Um, for a host plant for this butterfly. And then being able to identify the larvae because you we want to attract these butterflies, but in some instances, we don't know what the larvae looks like. So if we're out there and we see the larvae, we might think it's a garden pest and you know try to get rid of it. So it's being in tune with like what these look like, what kind of host plants they need. It's that food, shelter, water, and places to raise young. So it's that holistic approach of being able to incorporate all of those elements into your yard. And then we have a question for everyone. So if you can put in your answers in the chat box, what habitat elements does your landscape have already? And we want to give a minute or so to let folks um, answer that if you would like to put your answers in the chat box. That'd be great. We would love to um, see what everyone's starting off point is because everyone's starting off point is different. I see grass, hot, yep, dog poop. That is actually a habitat element, people. <laughs> um, I, what you will find is that dog poop is also for us. I don't know about everybody on this call, but in the West Coast, we have a lot of rats and they like dog poop. So it is a habitat element for more than necessarily what you want. Um, duck poop. I love someone said dead wood piles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, we're getting a lot here. And that's helpful to share with everyone else. Um, it, it, Kristen can actually download the chat and send it out if you want to see what other folks are doing and uh, what they're able to get in their yards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Go on to the next one. Thanks, y'all. And feel free to keep adding. Yeah. So we'll I'm going to talk. This. Yeah. So I'm going to take over from Sarah and talk about um, plants providing uh, habitat elements. So she took talked about food, wa uh, water, shelter, and nesting places. Plants can provide three of four of those. You may have, we get people with very small spaces and they were gonna talk about other things you can do if you can't put plants as the primary thing in your space for habitat. Plants can actually help you a lot as well. We wanna assure you there's something in this for you if you create habitat. Um, so they can actually make softer elements around your house, be a sensory experience where it's um, color and fragrance and texture. In my area, I have a very windswept valley that gets a lot of sun because the previous forests have been cleared. So the West Coast had the horrible heat dome last year. My, I have good shade around my house. I got by with like a couple of fans and it wasn't too bad. Um, I get a lot of windbreak from cold wind in the wintertime and that can actually help your house, uh, your energy use at home. Okay, so by using plants, you can actually, if you strategically plant, you can help yourself as well as wildlife. So we had in this area, a number of natural layers. So these layers, sort of a horizontal habitat or, um, or vertical habitat really created a lot of spaces for wildlife. And again, we are, we've got somebody from Utah, so your layers might be a little bit shorter or different, but in the Pacific Northwest, we had tall, tall, huge trees, these overstory canopy, then we had a shorter understory canopy, um, a shrub layer and a ground layer. The more layers you can put either artificially or with plants, the more wildlife you're gonna get. So like our Pacific chorus frog in, uh, is a ground dweller, but it'll also go up into trees. The dragonflies on the upper right are gonna be more of a ground and sort of shrub layer. 
the black Phoebe um, in the left is going to be kind of a shrub and mid story layer. And then we get big rafters and even some squirrels, insects that live very, very high in this overstory, like this bald eagle on the lower right. The thing I would tell you is if you're on a small lot, I showed that housing development. Some people have very, very small lots. If you have street trees, if there's a green belt behind you, don't feel like you have to have a giant tree on your property. Look around and borrow from your neighbors and see if they've got something. If they do, then put something different that's a habitat element in your yard. Okay, so we, unfortunately, in the beginning, we would tell people they needed all these things and they'd be like, I can't put a 150 foot tree in my yard. You don't have to, actually. Um, and I see a Holly question I can answer later if you want to save it, Kristen. I hate Holly. Uh, <laughs> so I will, what I talked about last week, you can get the PDF or watch the recording, is that all plants are not really the same for wildlife. I've linked the National Wildlife Federation article here that you can read. So you should be a little bit careful to be strategic about what you're picking. Um, native, native are, naturalized are all terms. It doesn't necessarily mean they have the best um, value for wildlife. So you're gonna wanna research for the wildlife you're looking to get into your yard to see if they're gonna support it. Native alternative is another one. And then just strictly non-native. And non-natives are not necessarily bad for wildlife. So let's just be really clear about that. It's just being thoughtful about knowing what you're buying and or getting as a gift from someone and what it means to your yard. So I'm gonna give you the definition for native. This really is for the United States, but it kind of is, I couldn't tell you, we had somebody from the UK last week and all of a sudden I thought, I don't know what native really the definition is in the United Kingdom because they had Romans coming in like forever ago. But for us, it's plants found in this country before European settlement that are considered to be native to the United States, strictly native. Again, you can have non-natives in your yard, but this is sort of the definition. And then there's the explanation, the scientific explanation at the top. So I always tell people to take a good look at your yard now. All of us, if you moved into a home like I did, I moved in with some plants that they planted. I brought some stuff in, some stuff was mistakes. I am notorious for buying uh, the red tag plants and then trying to recover them and then looking at them and going, why did I actually bring this into my yard? I see Sarah saying the same thing. But I have a lot that are not even native, but actually provide habitat value. And I, put, I have kept them for that reason. So you see a dahlia in the upper left with bees. Um, you see some rhododendrons. I do have our native Pacific rhododendron, which is our state flower. These are not native, but they get a lot of bees and they don't do anything bad. Um, and then even our purple cone flower isn't truly native to this area. It's West Coasty, but not to this area. But it's a great flower for both pollinators and um, it gets seeds for chickadees and they start to harvest them in like November, December. So there's a lot of plants that you can have that are just fine, but what do you wanna put in to kind of amp up your wildlife habitat and get some diversity? You will wanna get rid of invaders and sprawlers. So somebody asked about holly. It is really invasive on the West Coast. And uh, I had two trees. Um, they both got taken for um, marine wood. They actually have some value as a tree for marine wood. And then you have to really grind out or kill the stump. Um, but I replaced them with our native Oregon grape, which is on the right. Um, the other thing that I am slowly taking out, and I have to do this over time because it's a big lift, is junipers. So I was listening to Cisco Morris, is a local garden expert with a great personality. And he was like, ah, the junipers, they just grow everywhere. Just take them out. So I thought, great, I'm taking them out. They were great shelter, but they were also shelter for rabbits that were annihilating my landscape. So my neighbor helped me take out one. So what you see on the left, I had to trim back this rhododendron because the form was all screwed up because of that juniper. But all that diversity of plant life that you see on the ground, that all was in the space of one single juniper. It took up over 400 square feet. So if you get stuff like that, that's like not doing too much and it's sprawling, take it out even if it's not invasive. Um, in our area, the junipers, this was a non-native juniper, they can pass rust to other plants as well. I want to point out, because Sarah's going to talk about this uh, later on, in terms of nest, there's a habitat snag in the back of that picture. I left the dead tree as a habitat snag. So 
So I'll give an example of one species and how you might use layers for that species. And I'll go to hummingbirds. This is our uh, cheap way of educating you about concepts, but also giving you some information about species so you don't have to look it up. So we all think of hummingbirds as really loving the nectar in our feeders, but actually it's almost healthier for them to get nectar sources in nature. Everybody's probably had the male hummingbird take over the feeder and beat up everybody else that comes by. So by having dispersed plants in your landscape, you actually offer other hummingbirds a chance to get some nectar. So I have um, some edge habitat shown in the left. Behind there, you can't see as a red flowering current shrub, which is shown in the upper center in bloom. Um, that's a nectar plant and that's a shrub layer. But you see these low growing native and non-native plants, um, hostas, these are not native hostas. They're not invasive, they're pretty drought tolerant, but they will use hosta flowers. In the lower right is the salal flower and birds will use the berries. And then evergreen huckleberry is below the red flowering current. We get a lot of spiders in the fall on uh, evergreen huckleberry. And so the thing you should know about hummingbirds when we talk about complete habitat needs, they need protein, not just, just like butterflies, they need not just nectar, they will actually eat aphids and they will eat spiders. Um, and they survive a lot of times in the winter with spiders. So, you know, think about having this really diverse low growing layer that can help you with hummingbirds and other species. Uh, if you just have a patio, a deck, a balcony, you can actually grow a lot of hummingbird plants, native or non-native, in beds and pots. In the lower left is our native red columbine. Um, in the middle, uh, center bottom, and then in the upper right are uh, bergamot, bee balm. Um, and then we have a little hummingbird on, unfortunately, a blackberry stem. They really like them. Um, but there's a lot in the next slide as well that you can grow in raised beds or in pots. Uh, so for our area, we have a number of lupin species that are native. This is um, a big leaf lupin. There are two species or two varieties of pensamins are great hummingbird flowers. They're also great for bees and butterflies as well. And then we have native and non-native pucara or coral bells. In the lower right is a cultivar. Again, they're not taking over the planet. They're pretty drought tolerant and their teeny tiny little flowers are really a favorite of hummingbirds. I have both the native and non-native varieties and I bring in the non-native varieties basically for color. I like to have um, some color variety in my yard. If you get to that shrub layer, so we've been talking about low growing plants, that shrub layer, um, you there are so many hummingbird shrubs in our area, it's not funny. So I'm showing red flowering current again at the right and snowberry at the left, but here's a short list of hummingbird shrubs and they're shade tolerant and sun tolerant. So you have lots of choices in the shrub layer. We have a climbing layer. So it actually starts at the ground and climbs up through the trees. We have a number of different honeysuckles. The great thing about them is they are not as invasive as the honeysuckles people are bringing in. We've got some nasty escaped honeysuckles in Pacific Northwest. Um, these ones don't do that. Um, we have orange trumpet honeysuckle in the left and twinberry in the right. Um, there's also a hairy honeysuckle. I haven't gotten it big enough to get flower pictures of it yet. The nice thing too is if you like some more form to your garden, you can train all of these honeysuckles around trellises or arches or anything you want on fences. Um, I've seen them growing through fences and it's really pretty because you get this all this flowers and then hummingbirds and butterflies everywhere. And last but not least in your layers, trees. Uh, hummingbirds really need trees. They hang their nests in trees, they have shelter. We very occasionally get snow like we did a few weeks ago and Underneath those evergreen fronds, even if you have small ornamental evergreens in your yards, there's some place for them to get out of the snow. Um, they also find a lot of insects on trees. Remember, they're, they're getting protein. So that gives you an idea of how you can use plants to get layers. Um, it may not work for every yard, so you will see us talk about other options to get some of that structure back. So I'm going to hand it back to Sarah to talk about food and take a real deep dive into food. Thank you, Monica. All right, so natural food sources. So most of things that come to mind when we think of natural food sources are like berries and seeds and maybe sometimes insects. Um, 
but on top of this, you know, some, some wildlife will be browsing plants and everything like that. So we're kind of just going to dive deeper into some of those more natural food sources uh, for wildlife. And not only are you picking plants for food if you want to attract wildlife, but you also want it to be aesthetically pleasing for you too, right? I love seeing the flowers of the red flowering currants or uh, the berries of the service berry because I like eating them and I also try to leave them for the birds as well. Um, but what you're working with is your home space. So whether or not you're going to be potting some of these plants, if you have a balcony, or if you're going to be planting them uh, right in your home space, so in the soil. And in terms of being able to have all the plants you need, you we all have constraints. And so some of those constraints are going to be the environmental conditions. So you just want to make sure that is the right plant for the right place. And um, attached to this PowerPoint at the end, which Kristen will send out, will be some resources of where folks can find native plants that are native to their area. Uh, so we had a few comments in the chat about someone from California wanting some plant suggestions. Uh, I may not be the best person to provide like a list of five plants off the top of my head, but we can certainly provide you with a website where you can find those native plants and something that will work in your home space. Um, so we are looking at seasonal color. Dogwoods are always a great example for that. Um, and we don't want to have problems with pets and kids and maybe having something that's slightly toxic in our yard. Uh, so just being aware of things like that. Um, and if you need something that's drought tolerant or really wet loving because you have a pond on your property, it's keeping elements like that when you're planting um, to make sure you know that if you're going to spend money on the plant, it's going to work and grow in your yard. I have planted a Labrador tea in my backyard. It doesn't work in that space. I really try to make it work, um, but it's just really not the right type of soil conditions. You know, it's full sun, so it should be good there, but it really needs something more acidic, kind of like a boggier area. So being able to try to make things work versus knowing what should work based on those conditions that you have in your own yard. Uh, so berries in the winter, you know, we are constantly searching for ways to provide more habitat, more food sources for wildlife. And most of that is in the spring, summer, but you can be strategic in trying to identify plants that will offer uh, various elements that are going to be in the fall and winter and to see beautiful wax wings come sallying into your yard to get those berries and gobbling them all up. Um, it's nice color for you and being able to see some of these wonderful birds is always an enjoyment in my opinion. Um, so all the food groups, right? I love to eat vegetables, but occasionally I need some fruits and grains in my diet as well. So being able to keep insects, you know, not using uh, pesticides or insecticides and having various uh, places where birds and other wildlife can glean, can browse, and really get um, different nutrients that they need to have a healthy diet. Uh, so like this chickadee gleaning here has the bird feeder, but then it also is, uh, is that a nine bark? It's also gleaning from a native plant here. So finding those insects. And then hummingbirds, you know, as long as they also use spider webs for their nests, but they also eat spiders. They're really fatty um, and great protein for them to stay warm throughout those cold winter nights. Uh, nectar from flowers. So this is a Bullock's Oriole, I believe. Monica, mm -hmm. you can correct me if I was wrong. Um, eating from a poison hemlock. So not always like the best plant to possibly have in your yard, um, <laughs> but it does provide great nectar from the flowers. So identifying like, okay, if I have a big enough home space where I don't have to come in contact with this plant, it's, you know, it's really making those own careful decisions of whether or not you leave it, but just an example of um, a plant that provides a resource that we wouldn't necessarily think would be beneficial to wildlife. 
and the nectar from trees. So we have a red-breasted sapsucker here. You will see those very clean uh, vertical <laughs> holes that sapsuckers can make in trees. Um, so they're getting the sap and sometimes insects. And then what's great is that these woodpeckers will create these holes and it provides other foraging places for birds like hummingbirds and maybe anything else interested in some of this yummy sap that they can glean from a hole that was already made. Uh, and then insects. So insects are an important part of a bird's life cycle, in my opinion. And this hairy woodpecker and this western wood peavy here are great at foraging and finding insects. And so you'll see the Western Wood Peewee every once in a while, if you're in Washington State, can't remember where else they are, but sally out from a tree and then go back to the same spot and they're catching those insects. And, you know, sometimes they're catching them for their young. Um, whether or not a bird eats insects as an adult, 96% of terrestrial birds feed insects for young. So it's really that foundation of the food web is insects and then moving up from there. Uh, beneficial insects. Bottom picture is a ladybug larvae. I did not know that for so long. So knowing who your friends are in your, in your home space and being able to identify them as a larvae, so you're not un unnecessarily getting rid of something that you actually do want. Um, ladybugs love to eat aphids. Anyone with a garden or growing their own food has hopefully come to love ladybugs and appreciate all the work they're doing to keep those aphids away. And then more food for pollinators. So we think of bees, pollen, everything else. Uh, flowers are a great way to provide um, beautiful a beautiful home space for folks. Everyone enjoys seeing a nice flower growing in their yard. I always get excited when mine start to bloom, uh, but it is great sources for uh, bees as well. And so pollinators really do use all of those habitat layers that Monica was speaking about earlier. You know, having different layers brings in more diversity of what animals, wildlife will be using it. And then being able to uh, provide that cover and some of those other elements, uh, places to raise young. You know, most of our bees are ground nesting here in Washington state. And so being able to have like a clump of tuf tufted hair grass where, you know, bees can burrow in and have their nests and fulfill that life cycle that we've been speaking about. Uh, soil food is something that I don't think people consider enough. So having healthy soil, it's really that foundation up again. So insects, worms, all of those invertebrates are really important to the life cycle of various wildlife. And if that wildlife doesn't eat those insects or invertebrates directly, they may be eating something um, that really relies on that soil food for the whole life cycle and for their growth. Uh, and then timing of food delivery. I try to be really cognizant of what I have in my home space and when it blooms. So I'm trying to find shrubs and herbaceous species that are you know, starting in the very, very beginning of spring, you know, like Indian plum here is one of our first bloomers. And then going throughout the season, um, you know, goldenrod will persist into the fall, which is a really great thing for pollinators. And so having an idea of when the blooming time is, the color and the shape. Color will attract different bee species and same with shape. Um, if you look at a flower, its shape, sometimes it tells you what the pollinator is. So if we think of something like a foxglove, you know, they have those cute little bells, um, preferably not to go on a fox hand, um, but really for a bee or something to get in there. Anything that has like a long flower, you might think that a hummingbird is going to be the most perfect bird to pollinate that or to just use for their nectar. And then leaving winter forage. So 
having leaves on the ground is providing um, cover for insects. And then you'll see little dark eyed juncos or spotted tohis, you know, flipping up all those leaves, getting those insects in the fall and winter time. And it's really an important food source for them during these times where there aren't other food sources that are around during the spring and summer. So being able to leave those leaves and then leaving rough grass, um, having untrimmed ornamental glass and leaving sunflower, sorry, leaving seed heads on plants throughout the winter is something that is really going to help other wildlife uh, persist and be healthy until spring again, where they're all just interested in reproduction. Uh, so we have an example here of some trimmed grass versus grass that is not trimmed. So on the left, you can see that we have, uh, there's some seed heads poking up, but on the one to the right, they have all been trimmed. And so that is not providing that forage space for wildlife, uh, most likely birds in this case. Um, we are asking just to, you know, consider put off your trimming, you know, do it in the spring where other things are going to be growing. And then that is going to be the best case for maintaining your home space as well. And so when should we feed? Um, I believe it was last year or so, or maybe 2020, Monica, you can correct me, where we had a huge breakout of salmonella in mm -hmm. our area, um, Western United States, and I believe, you know, in other places throughout the United States. And so when we have a big congregation of birds coming to one area to feed at a bird feeder, it can spread disease. Um, and so we're, you know, in harsh habitat, harsh weather, you know, I do provide a hummingbird feeder and I put some Christmas lights on it so it doesn't freeze overnight. Um, and just being able to provide uh, supplemental food when you think appropriate, but doing it in a way that is going to help and not harm wildlife. So keeping it clean um, in instances like that. So yes, the problem with feeders. So they are, you know, sometimes dirty when we have a lot of birds coming. Um, I know that I used to feed birds. I used to have a bird feeder and I would often see Cooper hawks and sharp shinned hawks come and stalking the area. So all the birds would chirp, chirp, chirp. And I'd be like, oh, what's going on? And then you'd see a Cooper's hawk come in and swoop. And I'm like, oh, Cooper's hawk, cool. Oh, wait, oh, the birds. Oh my, ah, what am I doing? Um, and, you know, I, like most people may have experienced um, seeing a couple dead pine siskins. So pine siskins were one of the birds that really hit the hardest, uh, the part of the finch family. So I suspect other finches were hurt by this too. Other birds aside finches, but it's really that transfer of disease. You know, if you think, I think Monica used this um, analogy, but if you have a bunch of college kids gathering around like a pizza box and they're all in their dorm rooms and they're all just, you know, dirty teenagers and gosh, they're going to spread a disease really quick. Everyone congregating at that one space. Um, so we just ask that people be cautious and conscientious of what they're doing and helping reduce the risk of, you know, transferring disease to birds, especially. And Monica's going to go into about water. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through water. Um, we live in a really soggy place here in the Pacific Northwest. So you may be like, why are we like actually putting out water? Most of us may have to because here's one of the things that happened as we started reshaping the land. We've piped a lot of creeks. So creeks tend to wander around. And so when they wander around, they take up a lot of real estate. We didn't particularly like that. So we put them in pipes. Um, at a Brightwater Center, we've daylighted a uh, creek. There's a picture of a daylighted creek here. And you can see in the daylighted creek, there's some wood in the creek and there's some shallow and deep spots. So natural water does have a lot of variety. I live right next to a river. So for years I thought, why am I putting out water? Well, the problem is, is that there's not, it's a channelized river. So I don't have this complexity from shallow to deep. They were pulling uh, wood out of that river for years. So we don't necessarily have the water environment we need. So a lot of us are probably putting water out in our yards. Plus, the Pacific Northwest is a Mediterranean environment. So we have seasonal streams that just disappear because it gets super dry here during the summer. 
Um, so uh, as we keep saying, diversity will get you diverse wildlife. So having variety is good. You see in the upper left, a shallow water dish. This is gonna work great for small birds like hummingbirds. It's kind of bad environmental practice, but if you put a sprinkler on in the air, you'll find hummingbirds will swoop down through it. Um, I do it sometimes just for fun, just saying. Um, but bigger birds like these cedar waxwings in the lower right can actually use a bird bath. Um, you can put out amphibian dishes. When uh, Sarah talked about butterflies liking to puddle, you can take those clay pots uh, or uh, planter bottoms and then put gravel or dirt in them and actually hose them in and you'll get butterflies. If you put it in the sun, you'll get butterflies puddling on it. So you can kind of create some of these water sources for different species. And so what you want to make sure when you're providing water for wildlife is that it's accessible and safe. So you look at these two different types of feeders here and they've got shallow sides, they've got a rough surface. So I really personally like those bird baths that have this different color ceramic finish in the bottom because I love the color, but they're super slick. And so if something gets in and it has deep sides, it's not getting out, right? Then you need to be able to get out. So rough surface, shallow. If you wanna create shallow areas, you can put rocks in. So make sure you spray the dirt off of them so they don't get the water all dirty, but you can actually put rocks in to create shallow areas. Uh, so um, I'm gonna build a couple of ponds because like I said, I don't have really water variety in my river. It's just one giant river um, that's channelized. And so if you've got a pond, one of the things you're gonna to wanna to think about is are they gonna have water all year in that pond or not? Do you need to have water? People here have put water heaters out for when we get the occasional snowstorm or freeze. Is your water circulating? So at Brightwater here, we have a pond, it's a man-made pond and it got hot and it got algae in it and toxic algae. We had to close it so that people's dogs didn't get sick, okay? Um, and we've made some changes out here to make sure that that doesn't happen again, but you really need to think about keeping your water clean because otherwise it's not good for wildlife or your pets. So that's kind of the short story on water. Um, it'll be water sources will be in a lot of the references we send you. You can also Google it. There's so many water features out there. It's wild. Um, but I'm going to turn it over for another really important element, which is nest sites for different species. Take it away, Sarah. Thanks, Monica. All right, so many of the nest spots have disappeared with forests. So we're looking at um, long branches, big branches for you know, birds who are nesting in like little cups and building their own nests versus ones that are cavity nesters. Um, but they really have relied on these sites uh, historically. And so the lack of nesting um, cavities and spots for them to go has created some conflicts at times. Uh, with people and with birds, which, you know, no one wants a woodpecker trying to like put a hole in their house to nest in. Um, but some of these natural nesting sites are trees and cavities, branches, thickets, uh, lots of burrows on the ground. I think, you know, it may surprise you how many of our sparrows and other birds nest directly on the ground or very close to it. Um, logs are another one, leaf litter, and then shrubs and trees, of course. And, you know, birds will use structures when there's other, there aren't other places available to them. Um, so one thing you can do is put up a nest box. This is, I'm so jealous. This is Monica's photo of this American kestrel. Oh, it is so cute. I love, I love seeing little kestrels perched on wires. So cute. Um, there's a great, I think it's Nest Watch from uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology who really provides like the dimensions, uh, the size of the hole, the diameter of what, you know, can be tailored to each bird species. So you're with, when you're looking at kestrels or need something bigger than what a black cap chickadee will need. Um, and it's just a great website to either know what you're buying if you're trying to attract a specific bird and you see this bird box that you could purchase um, maybe just do a little research and make sure it's going to be attracting the best birds you want and or make your own um, always want to protect from predators so never putting something on the outside for the bird to perch on uh, and annual cleaning is always needed because of feces and everything else you want to just kind of give them a fresh slate um, and most nest boxes call for cedar shavings at the bottom in most cases. 
So nesting material, I have tried to provide some nesting material back in the day, uh, just using like grasses and things like this, but really be careful with anything that could have plastic in it, synthetic fabrics, materials. Um, so you have, we have one nest here to the left in the middle. Uh, it's made of grass and cottonwood fluff and dog hair. And then on the right, as you can see, Monica has a Bullock's Oriole nest and it is almost completely made out of plastic. Um, I have seen this myself where it's like those tarp long plastic bits that seem to like always get into other places rather than like staying on the tarp and not having holes. That's a, another problem with tarps, um, but really able to provide natural mes nesting materials and not yarn or anything that could harm the bird or get tangled around the leg is something we need to consider. And then nesting for insects. So there's pollinator hotels, uh, different ways you can help insects who are either stem nesting or need other considerations for wood dwelling and everything else. So just make sure that if you're providing uh, insect hotels that you are also cleaning annually as well. And make sure you know when to clean so that you're not harming any larvae that still might be in there. Um, this is something that a lot of folks struggle with. So I have struggled with this until I saw this great diagram of when to cut deadheads. So cutting deadheads is best in the spring. Like we are echoing throughout this, we want you to leave the leaves and leave the heads because that is important foraging space for wildlife in the winter and the fall. So cutting back deadheads in the spring is going to be the best way to provide um, and to keep those um, nesting places for bees and other things, but primarily bees in this instance. And hedgerows. Hedgerows are a great natural fence. They also are going to provide some color all year long in that food cover and nesting places. So it's that shelter where they can get into to hide from predators or get out of the hot sun and then insects will be attracted to them. So being able to provide, um, you know, whether it's seed or berries on the hedgerow, you know, you can diversify the hedgerow with including some different species um, and being able to ensure that you have uh, all your bases covered when it comes to habitat elements and providing some good places for birds to go when needed. And then Monica is going to cap us off with structure. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, so we're gonna wind it up here. So we talked, we've talked throughout about layers that work really well for habitat and habitat elements. You may not be able to provide all of them naturally. As I said, plants can do it, but if you can't do it, your hardscape will work too. So what you're looking at here are two little hummingbirds perching on man-made things. On the right, it's my weather vane. On the left, it's uh, my neighbors have a hummingbird perch, which I adore. I need to get one of these things because it's cute. So perches are incredibly important for a lot of different species and we don't often think about this. A lot of our ornamental trees are sometimes too tight to be able to allow adequate perching and they don't let a bird sit there and sing to find a mate, look around for predators. They don't allow uh, animals to hunt or rest. Um, sometimes you'll even see squirrels sacked out on giant branches and they're not really perching, they're actually napping. Um, and so perches are incredibly, incredibly important and each species is gonna use a different size. Um, so raptor perches are really important if you need control of insects and rodents. Um, I will give away, I feel very badly about these kestrels because I bought two next boxes. I put out up one and my neighbors did, they use my neighbors, but my neighbors are nice. So they let me come down and take pictures. Um, but you see one of the kestrels hunting from a natural perch on the upper right, that's the male kestrel. And then you see the pair sitting on something that my neighbor created, he had scrap wood and bought some dowels. So kestrels have teeny feet, they're the smallest of our falcons and he put like a piece of scrap wood and some dowels and they use that to hunt and um, to gather in the evening. So um, those are perches that work well for them. In the lower left, I put up owl and hawk perches because I had meadow voles eating everything I was planting and it was driving me nuts. Um, so I put up these perches, completely took care of my problem. Um, owls will also use trees and natural perches, but you can actually put up 
perches, the one on the lower left is gonna die sooner or later and I have taller trees now, but you can put those up temporarily or permanently if you don't have space for a tree. Uh, even insects need perches. So when we think about perching, the three of these pictures are dragonflies. I have a friend who's a limnologist and knows how to take a perfect dragonfly stick and hold it up and have dragonflies land on it. I am not a dragonfly wizard, haven't figured this out, but even having tall grasses helps dragonflies in their hunting territory. Um, and they like to sun on these types of perches. On the left is a Lorcan's or is a red admiral butterfly. There are a lot of butterfly species that are very territorial and they want a perch to be able to check for everything, including you. They will start flying around your head if they think you're invading their territory. Rockeries, loose rockeries, so not retaining walls, but loose rockeries are great diverse habitat and you can put a loose rockery in a fairly small space. Um, and what they do is they have cre little crevices and crannies where you can get a little bit of dirt, some insects are in there. On the right is a Pacific chorus frog in the rockery that you see on the lower left. Um, and butterflies will use them to warm up on the surface when the sun's out, they're cold-blooded insects, and then they'll crawl into them when it gets too hot um, or too windy for them to fly. So if you can put in natural rockeries in your hearts or in your landscape, um, Sarah salamanders will like that too. Um, so there's a lot that will actually use a natural loose rockery. Uh, wood is really important for habitat. So we deforested a lot of this area and we're missing a lot of wood. Um, these are Sarah's images on the left. She's a big salamander fan. Put logs in your landscape because you'll find salamanders are using them as well as snakes and frogs. They, you'll get insects in them and even fungus that's eaten by other smaller creatures. Uh, you'll see in our area restoration projects, we're putting wood back in the rivers because uh, even like small creatures in the rivers need it for shelter. Salmon needs uh, shelter and it cuts the current. Um, these, I'm gonna take down a walnut tree that's about to fall on my power line, not my planting. And I'm gonna put it in the river because across the river for me, as somebody anchored logs and these harbor seals are launched out. So this is a baby that wants to nurse and a mother going, yeah, no, you're annoying. Um, I want them on my side of the river too. So um, thinking about logs, they can be great perches for herons. They're places for otters to sit and eat. So logs, wherever you have them are great. We have actual guide for creating snags if you have a tree you don't like, um, and I put a link to that in here, but you can actually either create or just leave habitat snags, and I showed one earlier in the presentation. You can put your prunings to good use. This is an awesome article, great sense of humor. He has the same trouble pronouncing this technique that I do and calls it Google culture, which is very American pronunciation and incorrect. However, uh, this is a great way to use your wood trimmings on site. Um, and what you do is you make a raised bed, right? So you're gonna have really rich soil. People were asking last, last week, how do I get our native soils back? This is one way you can do it because this is what used to happen. Stuff would fall in the forest and then dirt and litter would, leaf litter would build up over it and it would rot. So this is, Google culture is a really great way to enrich your soil. It conserves water and it does create food and shelter and kind of complex habitat in a small natural raised bed setting. Brush piles, I'm gonna tell you, especially those of you who have rodents, I have brush piles way in the back field against the back fence and there are no structures nearby. Do not put them near structures and do not put them in neighborhoods where you have uh, rats. This is not a good idea, um, but um, this, there are some links on the bottom from uh, the University of Oregon or Oregon State University Extension and East Multnomah uh, Soil and Water Conservation District on building brush piles. You can actually build them if you've got the space and you're away from structures and get a ton of different wildlife that will use it for food and shelter and nesting places. And we have given you a ton of information in a very short period of time. Um, so that was a lot to throw at you. And we told you not to take notes, but what we really want to know is um, inquiring minds wish to know. And here are my inquiring minds. Um, what habitat elements do you think you want to put in your yard now that you've listened to that? We'd be interested to hear if you got something out of this that you suddenly had an aha moment where you're like, I want that thing in my yard. So, um, 
feel free uh, to add what you're going to add, and it might not be your yard, it might be your balcony or patio. Um, feel free to add some ideas that you have, and I am going to turn this over to Kristen, and I'll start answering some of these questions in the chat. All right. Um, can you go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, yes. So I just wanted to, first of all, thank Sarah and Monica um, for a really great presentation. I learned a lot myself. Um, but I also wanted to let you all know that um, if you're here today and excited about building habitat for wildlife, um, you should really consider coming to our next class because um, it's all about, okay, you built it. You attracted all the wildlife, maybe some you didn't necessarily intend to. And now what do you do with some of the um, guests that um, maybe you're having some conflicts with? So the next class is all about living with wildlife and Sarah and Monica will be presenting at that class as well, um, trying to work with nature and not against it. So how to peaceably live with all the wildlife in your yard um, or space. So yes, that is next Saturday um, at 10 a.m. So I um, hope to see you there. And we now have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and I do have a couple that I think we did not answer in the chat. Um, I can start with those if Sarah and Monica are okay with that. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so there was one question um, about uh, what you can plant under cedar trees um, instead of cutting them down and creating more space for sun for flowers this person would love to know what types of plants and wildlife would be good to um, to put under cedar trees to create habitat i have huge cedar trees um, and lots of stuff grows under cedar trees so we have a hummingbird plant called goat's beard and it has a, I don't have a picture of it in here, unfortunately it has a tall like <clears throat> uh, horsetail type white flower that hummingbirds love that will grow. Um, Lily of the Valley will grow. We've got native and non-native varieties of that. I have uh, shade loving hostas will grow. So the thing you need to know about cedar trees is that they're taking up water in the winter time, so they have high value to keep your yard a little bit drier. Um, they literally, a mature cedar tree will take up about 400 gallons of water a day, right? So removing cedar trees means you're gonna be managing a lot more water in your yard during the winter, especially here. Keeping them in, you are gonna have slightly more acidic soil. So you're gonna be looking for things that are a little bit drought tolerant, but can handle acid soil. And there are a lot of things that can. Right, I have everything from uh, deer fern and sword fern, right? I don't have maiden hair fern because it needs more water. What will happen with trees when you plant underneath them, so you need to keep adding compost and mulch each year because of this. As you add compost and mulch, the tree roots are gonna come up because they're gonna go, hey, there's some more stuff here. Um, so just keep adding compost and mulch and your plants will be happy and your trees will be happy. But if you look at some of the native plant resources, there's so many plants that love dense shade here and really hate it out in the sun. And you can find them and they will live happily under your cedar trees and give you really um, nice habitat. Be careful about, I do have containers like those um, half wine barrel things on the outside of the drip line of cedar trees, but you won't wanna put like heavy stuff over the anything in the drip line or you're st you'll start to kill the roots on one side and then they become wind unsafe, so. Great. Yeah, many, many plants will like the shade and just to kind of follow up with Monica or on what Monica said was just like huckleberry, red huckleberry is great, low organ grape. Um, you know, some of the resources we'll be sending out, you can check your environmental conditions that you're looking to plant and we'll pop up a list of native plants that are gonna work in your area. Great. Um, and then there was another one. You've, you've touched on this a little bit, but we had a couple of questions about like how to attract garter snakes specifically and um, if we still have them here. And the answer is yes. And I'll let Monica or Sarah answer how to specifically attract snakes. So um, it, it, garter snakes, I, I think across North America, I saw the northernmost uh, hibernaculum of garter snakes in Northwest Territories. Um, so I'm very proud of myself that I have seen <laughs> this hibernaculum. Um, so garter snakes like to have a place to get out of the weather in the winter time. They literally live 
in a crack, a cement crack. They go down in between, between my pad and my barn. Um, and so if you've got things like rockeries or someplace with deep soil that they can get out of, um, they need to be in the sun. So they'll try to find a sunny spot on mulch, especially um, to be able to rest and kind of sun up. Again, they're kind of cold blooded. Rockeries and mulch are one of the best things that you can have for garter snakes. Um, wood in the soil helps. You'll find they're underneath that. They need to have a certain amount of shelter where they're not being preyed on. So here's one thing I've done for years. I don't do it anymore because plastic's bad, but I would take six mil plastic and kill lawn by just putting it over it in the wintertime. And by the spring, it was dead. And then I could just dig it up and plant other stuff. When I would take it up, there would be tons and tons of garter snakes underneath it. They like to actually have some shelter. Um, I've started using cardboard and it turns up as mulch and it turns up they would get underneath the cardboard. It's a safe place to be where birds can't drag them out of there. So garter snakes are everywhere pretty much and it's just getting the right habitat in place and you will have them. I see something on rodent. Do you have anything to add on it? Cause you're the salamander snake person, Sarah. I was going to say a lot. I have like this mini rain garden and I have a lot of like sedges and rushes in there because it's pretty wet and I always see a garter snake in there. I would say that being able to, sounds bad, but like attract salamanders. So having the wood logs and things like that, because some of our salamanders um, are predated upon from the snakes, um, but also just like tall grass, you know, if you're not able, if you can just not mow your lawn and or have like a patch where you just want to kind of keep it rough grass, that's also a great place uh, where snakes can go and they can hunt and have some cover for them as well. There also was one more, one question about mountain beavers um, and if it's someone has them on their property and is it um, okay to keep them there um, or is it something that they should work on combating in some way? It depends on the impact they're having. They are a native species here. Um, it, they, unfortunately, we've moved into the habitat of a lot of creatures like beavers are like that. They can be we call them destructive. They didn't used to be destructive. They shaped our rivers and they shaped our landscapes. Um, but they really are not, um, we don't work well together. And that can be the case with mountain beavers. So you'll want to assess whether creating any slope or structural problems before you think about doing anything about them. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has some information on mountain beavers and we'll, you know, we'll talk more about how you manage your animals, but they have some information if you have to control them what to do. And then Kristen, can I add, uh, answer a question about a wet spot mm -hmm. in a lawn in the Pacific Northwest? So Please. anybody with wet spots in their lawn, your best bet for that is to have evergreen trees. They do not have to be full size, like Doug firs that are 150 feet tall, right? So evergreen trees go dormant during our dry summers and they pick up a lot of water during the winter. If you have water in the ground, they won't go dormant during the summer. Okay, and you can get smaller varieties that are native like subalpine fir, but you can also get ornamentals um, that can have habitat value and still take up water. Shore pine is one that's pretty windproof. It grows on the coasts here. I have a lot of it and it'll deal with both wet and dry conditions. And it's a good branching and perching tree for um, butterflies. So I would recommend if you can put even smaller evergreens in your space, that that will be the best. I'm not going to recommend willow and birch if you have utilities anywhere nearby. They will find them and suction into your sewer pipes. We deal with this all the time as the sewer agency. So, um, but evergreens are great and they'll do better service than a willow or birch would do in that environment. Those are all the questions I had that were asked a while ago in the chat, but I'm not, I haven't been reading the most recent ones because I'm multitasking, but. <laughs> I think there might be a couple more in there. Yeah, somebody was asking about um, uh, about brush piles. So brush piles actually provide, they can actually have multiple types of um, wildlife in them and some of them feeding on others. The problem with them in urban areas, we have introduced rodents. And if you've got a neighbor anywhere nearby who's got their pet food out, they're not cleaning up their dog poop, they're, they've got ivy, they've got fallen fruit, you're gonna have rodents in the neighborhood. If you put a brush pile up, they will find your brush pile. 
So my ones on the back fence, way in the back of my property, I actually, now they're tall enough. Part of the reason they're there is to keep my neighbor's uh, cows out while I have hedgerows growing up. But um, I actually think they, probably get rodents in them occasionally because I have harriers and hawks hunting from the top of them. Like they sit there waiting for the rodents to leave the brush pile. So that's why you don't want them in urban areas or near structures is because they're great hidey holes and food sources for things you don't want in your house. Okay, it looks like we had a question about someone, a neighbor, someone has a neighbor who has a ton of lights. It looks like a lit baseball field at night. I would say being able to plant densely with trees and it's going to take time, right? Because trees can be slow growers, but if you're able to find a tree species that's a faster grower, um, evergreen if this, in this case, if you want to cover all year round, but being able to plant densely to some degree to kind of try to block out that, but maybe not realistic depending on the size of your home space. Yeah, I have to say night, um, lighting at night in your landscape is really problematic for wildlife. I do not have night lights. So everybody in my area has farm lights, I do not. Um, it is really difficult for insects to and for migrating birds and light pollution is really, really problematic. So if you can avoid lights yourself and then try to filter out other people's lights, it's a really good thing. Oh yeah, there was one, this is the second time this person's asked the question. Um, somebody made a wildlife pond, which is great. And they're wondering if they need to seed the pond with tadpoles or will the frogs just come naturally? They may uh, just come naturally. Yeah, if you have a nearby water source, they'll find their way there, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, if you are attracting frogs, like our native Pacific chorus frog does burrow in mulch in the summer, make sure you've got deep mulch in your yard so they have a place to hide out. It's the only place they can get away from bullfrogs. Yeah, and kill bullfrogs if you see them, honestly. I think we just need to encourage more people to eat bullfrogs. I know they're a delicacy in other <laughs> places. And if we could all just get over it and just eat them, we'll get rid they of them. They were brought in for that purpose. I mean, that's why they're here is people brought them out. It's a cheap, easy food source. Yeah. Right. And then they escaped. So um, bullfrogs, so Keith is asking what's wrong. They will eat anything that fits in their mouth, including small birds. Um, they don't burrow, so they're out all year long. That's the only way our Pacific chorus frogs have survived. Otherwise, they would have eaten them all by now. Um, and there's so there's no predators, right? Bullfrogs have zero predators. Except for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's the problem with bullfrogs. Where they're supposed to be, they're fine. Um, because they're going to be more in balance, but they're just out of balance here. But they were literally were brought out by settlers to eat. Um, Let's see one more question. I started composting last year and found cockroaches in my compost pile. Are the cockroaches harmful and can I still use the compost in my garden? So uh, we don't really have cockroaches here. We had them in the Midwest, Chicago. They live everywhere. I would kind of avoid because they will find structures eventually and they can eat almost anything. Mm. Um, so if you're getting cockroaches, I would be a little worried about spreading it in your garden because you're just going to ship them closer to your house. Mm -hmm. Oh, eat the cockroaches. Yeah, insects are edible. I shouldn't, <laughs> I had a botany professor who said, you know, more people die when they get lost in the jungle because they won't eat insects. And I thought, unfortunately, I think I'm one of those people that would die in the jungle. <laughs> um, I saw another question come in. Yeah, there was. Uh, I haven't read it yet. Oh, there was a lighting one uh, about talking to cities. So yes, talk to your city councils. Um, actually, Seattle, I think, is thinking of passing an ordinance around light pollution. Um, we have green building ordinances where we have to consider uh, now both noise and light pollution in cities. So yes, definitely contact your local agencies because they're the ones that set the building codes. Right, so if they're allowing glaring lights high in the sky everywhere, um, that's a problem. And so definitely when you have the opportunity, they update, update building codes every few years, make sure that you're in on that. All right, a 
Okay, I want to honor everyone's time, including our speakers. So um, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Sarah and Monica, for a great presentation. Um, I put the link in the chat for joining us for Living with Wildlife next Saturday. So please join us. And I will be sending out a PDF of all these slides with lots of resources for you to really get going in your yard. Um, so yeah, thanks again for joining us. And we'll hopefully see you next weekend.